This teaching you're about to listen to was preached by Jagedis Sunday E and recorded live at God's Family Bible Church, Trinidad. Jagedis Sunday E is the general coordinator of Arabs of Revival Ministries and the School of Discipleship. He is also the missionary pastor of GFBC Trinidad under the leadership of Pastor Abology Akimbo, the general overseer of God's Family Bible Church Worldwide, Palm Coast, Florida. Listen and be transformed. Father, we thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Christ Jesus, to take our place in judgment. And on the cross, he took condemnation for us. He took the guilty verdict for us. On the cross, he took the punishment of our sin so that we can stand justified without fault, without blame in your presence. Father, we thank you. We celebrate this great work that Jesus has already accomplished and Father tonight we pray as we look into your war that by the help of your spirit our heart and our mind be open, our understanding be enlightened tonight that we will see very clearly that which Christ has already done that we will see very clearly that there is no more condemnation for all, no more guilty verdict for us, no more punishment for our sins now or later help us father to see this clearly and Lord I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that Lord they will not just see it, they will embrace this, they will celebrate this truth, this reality these blessings of the finished work of Christ father so that we can walk in it this year so that we can enjoy it to the mass, thank you father we celebrate you the spirit of truth tonight and we celebrate your ministry, we celebrate your work and your oppression in our heart. And as the word of the Lord come forth tonight, the sick are healed. By the power in the word of God, the captives are delivered. The oppressed are released. In the name of Jesus, the weak are strengthened. And miracles and wonders happen in the lives of every hearer and listener tonight. And Jesus is glorified. Thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Glory be to God. Once again, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Glory be to God. As I said, uh, uh, while we were praying, that it is very vital. It is essential. It is important for us this year, our year of restoration, to seek to regain our confidence towards God. If we are going to experience uh, what the Lord has for us, uh, that our, our pastor has declared to us, restoration in every aspect, then our confidence towards God must be in place. Our confidence towards God must be in place. Now, I didn't say confidence in God. I said confidence towards God. And as we move on, we are going to uh, clarify that. But I want us to know that it's important. Because it takes that confidence. It takes you having confidence towards God to boldly ask, to appropriate, and to walk in all that God has for you this year. It will take confidence for you to place a demand on the restoration that God has promised you. It will take confidence in your mind for you to actually experience it. So it is important. If there's anything that I must first of all seek to have or to regain or to put in place, is confidence in my mind. Confidence towards God. Now pay attention to this. The devil will seize every opportunity that he has to attack Believers' confidence towards God. If there is anything that is devil's prime target, if there is anything the devil wants to fight, if there is anything the devil wants to attack, if there is anything the devil wants to steal from my mind, it is the confidence, it is the boldness that I have towards God. Do you understand? Unfortunately, devil has succeeded uh, uh, stealing that from the mind of many believers. And that is why tonight uh, it is in my heart to talk about how 
you can regain that. How you can get back your confidence towards God so that you can boldly ask and you can boldly appropriate and receive and enjoy to the max everything that God has for you, that God has for your family this very year. Glory be to God. Are you still there? So the devil loves to go after your confidence towards God. The devil loves to go after it. And the way the devil does that is by condemnation. So the primary means by which the devil attacks, by which the devil steal our confidence towards God is by condemning us. It's by accusing us, all right? Because the devil knows you cannot have both together. You cannot have condemnation and also have confidence towards God. No, you can both cannot stay together. Glory be to God. Quickly, let's jump to First John chapter 3. And so tonight, let's talk about how we can regain our confidence towards God. How to ensure that our confidence toward God is in place as we trust God for restoration this year. As we trust God to fulfill His promises in our life this year. Are you see there? Follow me to First John chapter 3 and I'm reading from Amplified Classic Edition and I will read verses 20 and I will read 21. First John chapter 3 20 to 21 Amplified Classic Edition. So the scripture reads whenever our heart in tormenting self-accusation make us feel guilty and condemn us for we are in God's hand is above and greater than our consciences that is our heart and he knows he perceives and he understands everything nothing is hidden from him now pay attention to verse 21 now and be loved all right if our consciences our heart do not accuse us, that is, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confidence, that is, complete assurance and boldness before God. Let me quickly clarify this. Now, the, the, the word that is translated heart there is Chaldea, all right? But it is also translated the soul or mind or conscience. And in this particular text, it is better translated as the conscience. Why? Because if you are a child of God, you are born again. If you are a believer, your heart cannot condemn you. Do you know why? Because you've got a new heart. You have a new spirit, alright? And that is a heart, a spirit that is like that of Christ. It, God does not condemn. God is not origin or author of condemnation, alright? So if my heart is already like that of Christ, is a, if I have a spirit, a new spirit, a recreated spirit that is created after the likeness of Christ, that is one together with Christ, then that heart, that spirit cannot be a source of condemnation, alright? So the best translation is the conscience. The conscience is the sense of right and wrong, all right, that shaping our thoughts and action. So that is why you see some new translation, rather than saying our heart, they will say our conscience or our mind. That is a better translation, all right? Now, so what I'm saying is this, from this scripture, you see that you can't have both together, all right? So you cannot have the, 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 the condemnation, that is, a sense of guilt, and then have boldness or confidence to was God. So that is why the devil accuses you every time. That is why the devil seeks to condemn you. The devil knows once you buy into it, once you accept it, once you embrace it, it robs you of confidence towards God. And you need that confidence towards God to boldly ask for and appropriate and enjoy your inheritance in Christ. Is somebody paying attention to what I'm talking about? So it is important. Look at the way God's word translation put it. I prefer this rendition. First John chapter 3 verse 21. Now the scripture says God's word translation. Dear friend, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, that's a better translation. We can boldly look to God. We can boldly look look to God for the fulfillment of the prophecy. We can boldly look to God to fulfill his promises in our life. If our conscience does not condemn all. And so tonight, that is why we are looking at regaining our confidence towards God. 
Many believers have lost their confidence towards God. Why? Because they embrace condemnation from the devil. All right. So they cannot look boldly towards God. They cannot boldly approach God. They cannot boldly exercise their authority in Christ Jesus. They have no expectation of good. They are always expecting something evil or bad. Why? Because the devil has stolen confidence towards God in their mind. And so it is my strong desire tonight that everyone under the sound of my voice, if you have lost your confidence towards God, or if the devil has beaten down your confidence, and you don't have great, much assurance and boldness and confidence toward God, my desire, my prayer for you tonight is that you will regain your confidence towards God. So tonight, let's look at it. What does it mean? What does it imply to have confidence towards God? God. How do you know a believer who has, who exude, who show, who manifest, who display confidence towards God? All right, that is important to understand. So that's three questions we are going to seek to answer from God's word tonight. Number one, we try to understand what it means to have confidence towards God. Number two, we also ask, how does the devil actually attack and steal away our confidence? towards God. Alright, we're going to look at that very closely. And of course, we're going to ask, how do we regain our confidence towards God? How do we ensure that our confidence toward God is in place again in our hearts and in our mind? Are you ready to learn tonight? So let's get into it. So what does it imply? To have confidence towards God. How do you know a believer? How do you know a man and a woman who has confidence? A child of God that has confidence towards God. Let's go back to our text. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 verse 21. And I'm reading New King James. First John chapter 3 verse 21. New King James version. So, John the beloved, right? Beloved, that is you. You are God's beloved. If our heart, I have told you, that that is a wrong translation. It is our conscience. Cardia does not condemn us, all right? Our heart, new heart, cannot condemn us, all right? So, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God or confidence before God. What does that really mean? The word confidence here is the Greek war Parisia, Parisia. I believe you have it on the ball. P A double hard E S I A. Parisia. Now, what does that mean? It means freedom in speaking. All right. It means to speak freely before someone. So, when you have confidence towards someone, you can stand in the presence of that person and you speak freely without shame. All right. You speak freely without any fear of rejection. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You speak freely without any feeling of. Of condemnation. Why? Because you know that person totally accepts you, alright? And there is nothing you are going to say that that person is going to reject you or condemn you, alright? So that is what confidence means. Parisia means freedom in speech. It means unreservedness in speech. You are not holding anything back. All right, you speak freely, you speak boldly because you know you are completely loved and accepted uh, by the person that you are relating with. If somebody listen to that. It also means fearless confidence. All right, no fear at all. That if I have confidence towards you, when I stand in your presence or when I stand before you, there is no fear at all. If somebody listen to me, that is what it means. That there is no fear no fear at all. It means courage, cheerful courage. It actually means boldness and assurance. You speak boldly. You have an assurance, certainty that that person is favorably disposed towards you and that person is going to grant you your request. So that is you having confidence towards someone or confident before someone. Now it is different from you having confidence in that person and I'm going to uh, show you the difference uh, later on. But I I want you to understand what it actually implies to have confidence towards God. It means to be able to speak freely before God. 
To be able to speak freely without any feeling of shame. It doesn't matter what it is. Without any feeling of guilt. Without any sense of guilt or condemnation or any fear of rejection. There are some children of God that can do that. You know what has happened to them? The devil has attacked their confidence towards God. And right in the presence of God when they stand, they are always having a sense of guilt, feeling of shame and condemnation. Something is missing in your mind. It is called confidence towards God. When you have that, then you speak freely before God and you will have no sense of shame, no high altar of fear or guilt. Do you know why? Because you know you are not standing before your judge, you are standing before your father. Is somebody listening to what I'm talking about? You can imagine how will my son or my daughter uh, speak and then uh, he or she is uh, 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 ashamed or having a sense of guilt? No! She speaks freely, all right, boldly in my presence. That is what it means to have confidence, to be able to speak freely without any fear of rejection. It doesn't matter. You are completely accepted in Christ based on faith in what he has done, not based on your work or performance. So when I stand before God, it doesn't matter what I've done. I've just blow it all. I can talk freely about what I've done wrong. Do you know why? There is no sense of rejection. He's not going to reject me. Do you know why? Because he already put my sin and the guilty verdict and the punishment on his son, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That is what it means to have confidence towards God. It means to pray with boldness, with boldness. Not, not like beggars, all right? Not begging God and, uh, 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 and, and a vain repetition because you are not sure if he had you once or twice. No! It means you pray with boldness. You place a demand with boldness. And that is important this year as we are planning to start our fasting and prayer. I want us to pray with boldness, all right? Not like beggars, as children accepted by God, as one that has inheritance with God. That is why confidence towards God must be in place. Now look at scripture, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. Ephesians 3 12, I will read it in easy to read version and then I will read New Living Translation. You need to underline this scripture in your Bible. If Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, in Christ we come before God, is it to read version, with freedom. In Christ we come before God, how? With freedom, no protocol, and without fear, without fear. No fear of punishment, no fear of, he might turn his back, no, he won't turn his back. Are you listening? No fear of rejection. We can do this. Why? Not because we do everything right. We can do this because of what? Our faith in Christ Jesus. Glory be to God. That is important. That is what the devil wants to steal from you. That is what the devil wants to take away from you. The devil wants to take away confidence that comes only by faith in Christ. The devil wants to think the only time you can have confidence towards God is when you have done everything right. And none of us ever does everything right. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So, if you want your confidence to be based on your work, you will never have it. It is by faith in Christ Jesus. Is that taking? Look at the way New Living Translation put it. Very beautiful. He said, because of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Boldly and confidently. We don't drag our feet. Hallelujah. No protocols of Zah. First John 3 verse 21. First John 3 21. Passion translation. My delightfully loved friends. When our heart don't condemn you, don't forget that's conscience. We have a bold freedom. I love that. A bold freedom to speak face to face with God. Bold freedom. That is what confidence towards God looks like. God's word translation, the same scripture, 1 John 3, 21. Dear friend, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we can boldly look to God. 
But it doesn't matter the situation. We can boldly look to God for help. We can boldly look to God for miracle. We can boldly look to God for intervention because we have confidence towards Him. First John three twenty one Amplified Classic Edition. And beloved, if our consciences do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confidence. And look at what they call confidence. Complete assurance and boldness before God. So what does it imply to have confidence towards God? It means to have this confident, complete assurance that God will always answer your prayers. There are many children of God that don't have that. All right? Now, so they think God answering their prayer is dependent or contingent upon their performance. All right? And so there are times when the performance is not good enough by their standard. They don't expect answer to their prayer. Do you know there are people, now listen to this, there are people that ask you to pray for them. All right? Now, they believe in God, that God answer prayer. But somehow they don't have confidence towards God that he will answer their prayer. They have, but they know that perhaps if you pray, all right, God will answer. Now, we see that is showing that the devil has attacked. He has stolen confidence towards God from you. If you think that God will answer my prayer and reject your prayer and you are a child of God, then something is missing in your mind. It is confidence towards God. Confidence towards God is a, a confident assurance that is your father. And when you cry unto him, he answers you. Are you listening to me? Because he has said, whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, I will answer. So when I truly believe that, and I have confidence, assurance, that when I pray, he answers. Are you listening to me? That means I have confidence towards God. That is important. That is important. Now, our confidence towards God is you having a confident expectation that God will fulfill his promises to you. That is important. That God will do what? He will fulfill his promises. And this year it is important. If we want to see uh, the, 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 the fulfillment of the prophetic word that God has given to us as a church, our confidence towards God must be in play. We must have this expectation, this bold, confident expectation that God will do just what he has said he will do. Are you listening to me? That is important. That is important. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Now confidence towards God imply you exercising your authority in Christ with boldness, without any fear of the devil. If you don't have confidence towards God, you will not be able to stand before the devil to resist him using the authority that God has given to you. It takes confidence towards God that as you speak, it backs you up. Are you listening to me? That when I speak in the name of Jesus, when I receive the devil, it is just as if Christ himself is speaking. That is confidence towards God. That he backs it all. It is his authority. And when I use that authority, he backs it all. That is confidence towards God. Now listen to this. Confidence towards God implies you having an expectation of good at all times. Expecting that God will be good to you. Expecting God's goodness at all times. Even in your worst days. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? There are some that expect punishment from God because of the mistake that they make. What has happened to you that the devil has stolen your confidence towards God. When your confidence toward God is in play, you expect God to be good to you at all times. Not because you are always good, alright? Because he's a good God. Are you listening to me? And his goodness towards me it's not dependent on my word. It's dependent on faith in Christ Jesus. That is important. I wish I had better words to explain that. So, our confidence to what God is you expecting God's goodness at all times. And this year, I want to plead with you to expect God to be good to you at all times. I mean, at all times. Are you listening to me? It doesn't matter the situation. You just mess up. Still expect God to be good to you. That is what is called having confidence towards God. That is a good father. 
It will always be good to you. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Now, my daughter expects me to be good to her, and she has confidence that I'll be good. Even when she doesn't clean her room. Are you listening to me? She just know I will be good. All right? And I always, I always look at that. I always think about that. If my daughter can have so much confidence that I will be good to her, how, what is wrong with me? Why shouldn't I have much confidence that God, who is a better father, will be good to me at all times? I want to this year to expect God to be good to you at all times. He's a good God. And that is confidence towards God. Now, look at this very closely before we move on. First John chapter 4. This is important. Having confidence towards God means you are looking forward to the day of judgment without any fear. Without any fear. That is important. First John chapter 4, 17 and 18. I read God's word translation. First John chapter 4, 17 and 18. God's love has reached his goal in all. So we look ahead. Now look at John speaking. We look ahead with confidence to the day of judgment. We look ahead with what? Confidence to the day of judgment. Do you look to the day of judgment? So Christ return with confidence. If not, then the devil has stolen from you. He has stolen your confidence. If when you think of when Christ will come or the day when you will stand before him, if there's still a fear of punishment, if there's still a fear of rejection, it means you don't have confidence towards God. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So confidence towards God means I look forward to his return. I look forward to when I will stand before him without any fear of punishment. Do you know why? Because Jesus already took the punishment. No condemnation. No guilty verdict. No punishment is awaiting the believer. But you know, there are still some believers that are still not sure. There are still some believers that still think there's still a sin that God is still going to punish on the day of judgment. That is believer, a believer whom the devil has stolen his confidence towards God. Confidence towards God imply looking forward, just like John said, with confidence. No fear, no fear, no fear of punishment, no fear of rejection to the day of judgment. Look at what he said. We are looking forward to the day of judgment. Do you know why? Because we know we are going to judge with him. Hallelujah. We are not the one that we judge. We are the one that sits with him and judge the nation. Many believers don't get that. It is because the devil has stolen our confidence towards God. Now listen to this. Pay attention to this. Now, confidence towards God is not the same thing as confidence in God. Confidence in God simply speak of you having trust in God. What is the difference? Look at John chapter 13. Let's quickly do that as we move forward. We are talking about regaining our confidence towards God. And that is very essential. Now, John chapter 13, look at what happened here. You remember uh, uh, when Jesus had just finished the supper with his uh, disciple? It was close to when uh, he will be crucified. It was a tense uh, moment. All right. So look at what happened. 21 from uh, verse 21. John chapter 13. When Jesus had said this thing, of course, it was trouble in the street. He just told them, one of you is going to betray me. And testified and said, most assuredly I said to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciple look at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Of course, you know that is John. He called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He referred to himself as John the Beloved. So it was a tense uh, uh, atmosphere. Jesus was talking about a betrayer among his close disciple, and everybody was shocked. Everybody was perplexed. Everyone was confused. Now look at what Simon Peter did. Twenty-four. Now Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it, it was of whom he spoke. He motioned to John the Beloved. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, "That is John, Lord. Who is he?" Jesus answered. It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread, and when I have dipped it, and having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, pay close attention to what happened in this passage. So, Jesus told them that one of you guys will betray me, alright? 
And everybody was perplexed, and everybody wanted to know who it was, all right? Everybody wanted an answer. But you see, Jesus was troubled. They knew this was not a, a, a time to play around. This was a tense time. He was talking of something serious. Okay, now, now pay attention. All the disciples, every one of them, they knew Jesus loved them. Do you understand? Every one of them have accepted Jesus as their Lord, as their Master, as their Messiah. They have confidence in Him. They have trust in Him. They have faith in Him as their Lord, as their Master, as their Messiah. Do you agree with that? All right. Now, but something is missing. Now, all of them, beside, apart from John the Beloved, who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, it was only John among the rest, the, the disciple, that had confidence towards God, towards Christ. Now, how do we know that? Now, any one of them could have asked Jesus, who is it that will betray you? And Jesus will answer. I mean, I'm not going to agree with that. Jesus will answer. But none of them had that kind of confidence, that boldness. I told you confidence towards God means freedom to speak. Do you understand? It means boldness to speak, liberty to speak without fear, expecting God to answer. But none of them had that kind of freedom, that kind of confidence. Not because Jesus would not answer, but because they had no confidence or little confidence towards him. But John, look at John, even in the, though it was a tense atmosphere, even though Jesus was speaking about his death, Jesus was talking about betrayer, yet John put his head on Jesus' breast, on Jesus' bosom. Are you listening to me? He never left the place. Even when Simon Peter called him and said, can you ask him who he was referring to? John went back, putting his head back there, and then asked Jesus, and Jesus answered. Now that is confidence towards Jesus. He was so sure. John the Beloved had this liberty, this freedom. Every one of them could have had it. Every one of them had the same access to Jesus. Are you listening to me? But the devil has stolen confidence towards God from them. So you see, confidence or trust or faith in Christ is different from you having confidence or boldness towards Jesus. So in this passage, it was only John the Beloved that had boldness Towards Jesus, liberty, freedom, to talk freely in the presence of Jesus, to ask Jesus freely whatever he wanted to know, and also an assurance and expectation that Jesus will answer. The rest did not have it. Is that taken? So that is the difference between confidence in Christ or confidence and confidence towards Christ. Let's quickly look at this. So how does the devil attack? How does the devil steal our confidence towards God? I've told you earlier that that is devil's prime target. That's what the devil wants to get from you. That's what the devil wants to get. He will seize every opportunity. He will use every occasion because he knows once that is not in place, all right, in the place of prayer, you are not sure anymore, all right? Even though you are asking, you are repeating the same thing, there is no boldness. There is no confidence that God will answer. There is no expectation that there will be answer to your prayer. He knows that even in spiritual warfare, you are not sure that if you exercise your authority, God is going to back it. Why? Because he has robbed you. He has stolen from you confidence towards God. Somebody listen to what I... So how does the devil do that? The devil primarily attacks and steals our confidence towards God through condemnation. Very important. So one of the major instruments, all right, that the devil uses are to steal or to beat down our confidence towards God is condemnation. So let's look at that very, very closely. Now, First John chapter 3 verse 21, we've read that scripture before. So the Bible says, if we, our conscience does not condemn us, then we will have confidence, that is assurance. I'm reading Amplified Classic Edition. If, if our conscience does not make us feel guilty and condemn all, then we will have confidence, that is complete assurance and boldness before God. Before God. Now pay attention to this. So the word condemn there, the word condemn, it is the Greek word kataginosko. Kataginosko. It simply means to find fault with someone. It means to accuse someone, to blame someone, to note something against someone. 
And that is what the devil does, all right? So if the devil wants to steal your confidence, what the devil does is that the devil comes to you and finds fault with everything that you have done, all right? So he accuses you of not doing what you're supposed to do. And even the one you do, he accuses you of not doing it with right motive. He just finds something to accuse you all. He finds something that he notes against you. And that voice just keeps coming. So the devil does it. Pay attention to this. He does it through your conscience, through our mind. So that voice just keep coming from within you. All right? And the devil wants you to mistake that for the voice of God. Now, pay attention. This, this, I don't want you to miss it. Now, you see, the devil is the sole source, is the sole origin and author of condemnation. That, you must know it and settle it once and for all. All right? If it is an accusing voice, if it is a voice of condemnation, that is not God's voice. That is the devil. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Uh, from verse 9 and 10, you know uh, uh, what happened. There was war in heaven. And of course, uh, the devil fought, the great dragon and angel, uh, Michael and his angel fought. But let me jump to verse 9 because of time. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angel were cast out with him. Pay attention to verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Why? For the accuser of our brethren, the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. That is the devil. That is his sole ministry. He is the primary sole source, origin, author, fabricator of condemnation. If it is condemnation, it is from the devil. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? If a voice is condemning you, beating you down, and telling you you are not good for God uh, to give you what you're asking God for, you are not qualified to receive the blessing, you are not qualified for God to fulfill His promise in your life, that is not your father. That is not the Spirit of God. That is the accuser of brethren. That is the devil. And the reason why the devil does that is because he knows once you buy into that, once you accept that, once you entertain that thought in your mind and it takes root in your mind, your confidence will evaporate. Every confidence you have will disappear. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Now, you're going to see why that is important. So I want to uh, establish this truth that God is never, God is not, God has never been the author of condemnation. John 3, 17, John told us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Take note of that. The world. The world talks of the ungodly mass of, of, of re, re, rebels to God, rebellious, disobedient people. That's what the world referred to. And he said, Jesus did not come to condemn the world. So if he did not, Jesus did not condemn the world, will he not condemn the children of God, the believer who have put faith in him? Do you understand what I'm talking about? If he did not come into the world to condemn the world, then he cannot condemn the believer. In John chapter 8, you remember the story? Let me jump to 10 and 11. A woman that was caught in the heart of her daughter in the very heart, and they dragged him to Jesus. Of course, uh, they wanted Jesus to pass judgment, guilty verdict, to condemn her, all right, to accuse her that what she has done is wrong, and according to the law, she's supposed to be thrown to death. But Jesus wouldn't do that. Do you know why? Because he's not the author of condemnation. Alright, when Jesus, verse 10 and 11, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but a woman, he said to her, Woman, we are those accusers of yours. He has no one condemn you. She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I. Who has the right to condemn if he will have to condemn. It is Jesus, a perfect, righteous man who did nothing wrong, who has never done anything wrong. But he said, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. So you see, God is not the author of condemnation. If Jesus did not condemn, then God does not condemn. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Because Jesus is a perfect representation 
of the Father to all. Jesus came to reveal the Father to all. Jesus is the Father interpreted. He interpreted the Father to all. So if Jesus did not do it, then we can be sure that our Father does not do it. We can be sure that God's Spirit will not do it. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? If Jesus does not do it, then God the Father, God the Spirit, we not do it. And of course, I've told you, condemnation does not come from your new heart or spirit. What I'm saying to you is that condemnation comes only from the devil. Now look at this scripture. Glory be to God. Look at Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Amplify. And I want us to understand what condemnation is. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Amplify. Therefore, therefore, there is now no condemnation. If that is your Bible, you need to underline it. No guilty verdict. No punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. The word condemnation in that text is katakrima. Katakrima. K-A-T-A-K-R-E-M-A. Now, listen to what it means. It is actually a, a word that is used in judicial setting. It is like a, a legal Terms, a legal terminology. It is the opposite of justification. So when you hear condemnation, it is the opposite of justification. You cannot have both together. You cannot be condemned and justified at the same time. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So if you are justified, it means you are not condemned. If you are condemned, it means you are not justified. Now, condemnation, catacrima, also means damnable sentence. It means adverse sentence of verdict. And pay attention to this. This is important. It means verdict of guilt. Verdict of guilty. That is, uh, uh, someone has committed an offense and he stands before a judge and the judge says, after I've listened to your plea and all that, I find you guilty. Alright? Now, now, so that is the person is condemned, alright? So there's a verdict of guilty that is part. There's a damnable sentence. But listen to this. That is not just what condemnation is. Condemnation now implies the punishment that goes with it. So, condemnation is not just the devil trying to accuse you. The devil trying to say, well, uh, you have not prayed enough. You have not fasted enough. You have not given enough. You have not done this enough. So God is not pleased with you. God is not going to give you what you're asking for. God is not going to bless you. God is not going to prosper you. God is not going to uh, defend you and all sort of things. That is, it doesn't end there. The word condemnation means once you accept the guilty verdict, then expect the punishment. Somebody listen to what I'm talking about. That is so important. It means there is a judgment, there is a punishment that comes with that verdict of guilty. So you can't say a criminal that has just been tried and found guilty and uh, they just say, well, you are guilty. All right? And then when they say you are guilty and then we are sentencing you to 21 years imprisonment. Now you cannot say, no, I will accept I'm guilty, but I will not accept the punishment. Is that possible? No! Once you accept the guilty body, then you embrace the punishment that follows. Now, so you see, when the devil condemns us and will embrace it, now we are putting ourselves in a vulnerable position. Because if I embrace condemnation, then I disqualify myself from blessing. I disqualify myself from good things. Are you listening to me? Then I open up myself to punishment and judgment. That, so condemnation attracts evil, alright? So once the devil condemns me, and I say, and I agree with the devil, and I embrace it, and I allow that accusing voice to keep speaking, and I allow that accusation to take root in my mind, I already shut the door against the goodness of God. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? What we follow is evil. What we follow is punishment. What we follow is judgment, not from God, but from the devil. And the devil knows because the devil always disguised. The devil wanted to think that it is the spirit of God that is accusing you, that is telling you that you are guilty, that you are, you are, you are not qualified for the blessing, that because of what you have done, judgment is coming. The devil wants you to embrace that so that when it comes, you accept it. All right? So that when it comes, you don't even have boldness to look to God for mercy. You won't even do that because in your mind, the devil has convinced you that that is God punishing you for the wrong that you did. 
And that is why we must not embrace it. That is why in this year 2022, we must ensure our confidence towards God is in place. That is, we are always expecting God to be good to us at all times. We must shut up and shut down every accusing voice because it does not come from God. So, katakrima means verdict of guilt and also the penalty that follows. That is why the Bible says no condemnation for you. And I believe I say it means no guilty verdict, no punishment. Can you see it together? No guilty verdict, no punishment. That is what condemnation means. But for you in Christ, there is none. Hallelujah. That means that is not from God. I love the way that no is the Greek word who dies. Who dies means nothing. None at all. None at all. Let me close with this. Our time is gone. So quickly, how do you regain your confidence towards God? Three things, and I'll just go over it, and then we pray. Number one, I've said it before, you must recognize that the devil is the sole source, origin, and altar of condemnation. Never for one thing that God is the one condemning you. Are you listening to me? That is how you regain your confidence. You regain your confidence by resisting, by refusing, by rejecting condemnation from the devil. And the only way you will be able to reject that is if you are sure that it is from the devil. So always remember that condemnation, accusation comes only from the devil. He can choose to use anyone, but he is the source of it. He is the manufacturer of it. And you, he is the accuser of the bread. He is the fabricator. He is the author. It comes from him. He may be speaking through your mind, your conscience. He may be speaking through someone, but it is the devil that is behind it. So what do you do? Stand your ground and reject it and refuse it. So that's the way you regain your confidence towards God. Know that it is not your father condemning you. It is not the spirit of God accusing you. God keep no record of sin. Your sins and their iniquity I will remember no more. That is a new covenant. So God cannot be reciting my sin to me. Are you listening to me? It is the devil that recall it, that bring it back to my mind. That is what accusation is. That is what condemnation is. Number two now. Now so you need to now Understand, it is important. You need to have a precise, correct knowledge, understanding of your justification by faith in Christ. Justification by what? Faith in Christ and in Christ and in Christ alone. Now, opposite of condemnation is justification. All right? One cannot be justified and condemned at the same time. So if I understand my justification and I embrace it and I'm establishing it, now guess what? There is no place for condemnation in my heart, in my mind. But the reason why we embrace condemnation is because we are not well established in our justification. We need to be taught again and again what it means to be justified. What it means to be justified because that is our safeguard against condemnation. Now, quickly look at the scripture. Let's take this before we close. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'd love to read Amplified Classic Edition. Let me read verse 1 because of time. Therefore, since we are justified, we are not going to be, we already are. That is our state now, and that is our state forever. Are you listening to me? We are justified. Look at what it means. Acquitted. Declare righteous. And giving what? A right standing with God. How? Through faith. Through faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. So when I understand that, that me standing acquitted, declare righteous, having the right standing with God comes by faith in Christ. It means I always have it. If it comes through my performance, now when my performance is below God's standard, then I won't have it. I won't stand justified in his presence. But always I wake up in the morning and I know I'm justified. Do you know why? Because it is by faith in what Christ did for me. Now, amplify the same scripture. Since we have been justified, that is acquitted of sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is, the devil is pointing to. Past, present, future. We are declared blameless before God by faith. Passion translation, the same scripture, Romans 5, 1. Our faith in Jesus. Take note of that, underline it. My faith in Jesus transfer God's righteousness to me. He now declare me flawless in his eyes. 
You cannot truly believe and embrace that and also accept condemnation. You cannot. You cannot. If you are establishing that, that you are flawless, you are blameless, you are guiltless before God on the account of faith in Christ, there is no, it doesn't matter how many times the devil condemns you, it will stick. Are you listening to me? Because you are secure, you are established, you know it, you know it so well. This year I want us to know it so well. We are justified. We stand before God blameless, flawless. We are qualified for everything that God has for us. Don't listen to the voice of the devil. Let's close with this. So when the devil speaks, what do you do? Open your mouth and speak loud and clear that you are justified. Declare what God has said about you. Declare what Jesus has done. Let's rise to our feet. So what do I say when that voice of accusation is coming? I need to open my mouth and say, I am justified through faith. Hallelujah. I need to boldly declare that Christ's righteousness, God's righteousness has been transferred to me. And I'm standing flawless. I am justified, acquitted of my sin. So when the devil is accusing me of something, I said, the devil, your, your record is not up to date. I have been declared guiltless of it. Righteous. I have been what? Acquitted. What you are talking about, I have been what? Acquitted of it. Acquitted of it. Forgiven of it. Glory be to God. So whenever an accusing voice is rising up in your mind, in your conscience, don't keep quiet. Open your mouth and boldly declare what Jesus has done. He took your punishment. He took your condemnation. He took your guilty body. So open your mouth and say, He took condemnation for me. Now I have justification. He took my guilty body. So now I am declared not guilty. He took my punishment. So now no punishment, no causing. All that I have is the blessings of God. That is important. I want you to lift up your voice if you believe the word of God. Open your mouth and say, no condemnation for me. No condemnation. No guilty body. I am justified. God's righteousness has been transferred to me. I stand blameless. I am qualified for everything that God has in mind. Everything that God has promised this year. The restoration God talks about. I am qualified for it. I am qualified for it. He qualified me. No sin disqualify me. Sins are forgiven. God keeps no record of sin against me. He holds no record. He keeps no record. Oh, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you did for us. You sent your son to be a perfect substitute for us. And on the cross, he took our place. He took our sin. Our sin was placed on him. The guilty verdict that belongs to us was placed on him. Condemnation that should come to us was placed on him. And the punishment was placed on him. And you declare us free. You said to us, acquitted. You said to us, righteous, discharged. Father, help us. Help us to truly believe your word. Help us to truly embrace it. Help us to be established in this truth. So that when the devil tries to condemn us, we will boldly declare that we are declared guiltless. We will boldly declare that we are justified. So that this year, everything that we have promised us, we will boldly demand for it. We will boldly appropriate it. We will receive it, Father. So that nothing will stop us. Nothing will stop us. This year, everything you have for us, we will enjoy it to the mark. We will receive it. We will say no to condemnation. We will say no to the devil. We will not embrace condemnation. We will not accept it for a second. We will refuse it. We will reject it. We will resist it continually. We will always declare our righteousness in God's presence. Father, we thank you. We give you glory, Father. We give you praise. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory be to God. We hope you have been challenged encouraged and motivated to become more like Christ by today's teaching. If you would like to find out more about Errands of Revival and get additional teachings and materials for your healthy spiritual growth, visit our website today at www.eradsofrevival.org or if you would like to enroll at our School of Discipleship, visit our website www dot the school of discipleship dot org dot uk this teaching was made possible by the prayers and generous free will offering donation and gifts from partners like you you are welcome into partnership with us today for information on how to become a partner please call one 292 
1-866-703-9270 or 1-866-703-5572 or you can email us at info at erasofrevival.org.uk Thanks for listening.